money has a lifespan. Let me explain. I have in my pocket right now, I pulled out some money the other day, I have $300 in my pocket. I rarely have cash. I'm the worst guy with cash and I feel bad because sometimes I have to tip and I don't have cash. So I carry money just for one reason, for tips. So here's a question, ready? How long is this $300 gonna last in my hands? That's lifespan. Money has a lifespan. This thing's got a lifespan. This is gonna go. It's gonna go in someone else's hands. How many hands are gonna touch this? What, what part of the world is it gonna end up in? China, maybe Japan, maybe someone has this and it's their money and it goes to Chase Bank and B of A, then a credit union. It's gonna go all over the world. This is gonna travel. It's got a lifespan. Listen, legacy and expertise and mastery doesn't have a lifespan. That's forever. Makes me know what I mean by that. Shakespeare is dead. He's not dead. He's still alive. Einstein's not dead. He's still alive. Churchill is still alive. George Washington, still alive. Lincoln, he's still alive. Benjamin Franklin, he ain't dead. He's alive. I'm not talking alive like they're living on an island with Elvis and freaking Prince and Tupac and all. I'm not talking that kind of alive like conspiracy theory alive. But I'm talking about they're not dead. They are around. Everybody talks about it. But the people that chase money, they are really dead because no one's talking about it. Their legacy is over because they chase money. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Awesome Wholesaler Experience podcast, where we look into the many facets of the job, the career, and the lifestyle of investment and insurance product wholesaling. I'm your host, the creator of the Awesome Wholesaler Experience, and yours truly, Awesome Mike. Good evening, anyone, everyone, <laughs> all of you. Terrific guest on the show today, a, uh, a real guru in his own right, and he's still a young man, so it's kind of hard to call someone a guru being that that uh, he's, he's still, uh, I don't even think he has any gray hairs just yet, but uh, he's a very young man. But let me go ahead and read his bio, pay him a tribute, um, and allow me to, to begin. Patrick Bet David has an amazing story. It starts with his family immigrating to America when he was 10 years old. His parents fled Iran as refugees during the Iranian Revolution, where he eventually uh, was granted U.S. citizenship. Now, after high school, Patrick joined the U.S. military, the Army to be specific, and served in the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault before starting a business career in the financial services industry. Now, after a 10 year with a couple of traditional companies, he was inspired to launch PHP Agency Incorporated, an insurance sales, marketing, and distribution company. He did all this, by the way, before he was 30 years old. Now, Patrick's popularity surged and really created a buzz in the hearts of entrepreneurs all over the world. When the life of an entrepreneur in 90 seconds, a video that he created, accumulated over 30 million views online. It actually became a book in June of 2016 called The Life of an Entrepreneur in 90 Pages. Please go check it out. You would really enjoy it. I promise you. Now that video scores, actually that video and scores of other videos comprise his library of edifying, educational, and inspirational content about entrepreneurship, all available at Valuetainment his media brand uh, that he conceived and, and founded. Now, Valuetainment exists to teach about the fundamentals of entrepreneurship and personal development while inspiring people to take break, to, to, excuse me, to break from limiting beliefs or other constraints and achieve their dreams. It has been referred to as the best channel for entrepreneurs. Patrick speaks on a range of business, leadership, and entrepreneurial topics, including how and why to become an entrepreneur, and the importance of learning how to fully process issues. He is particularly passionate about the need for every individual to pursue their dreams and their desires, once stating that most of the greatest world changers and heroes of all time are at the graveyard, undiscovered because they never sold out to their dreams and desires. Patrick has also hosted a series of incredible one-on-one -on -one interviews with some of the world's most interesting people, including NBA Hall of Famers James Worthy and Magic Johnson, author Robert Greene, billionaire entrepreneur and NBA team owner Mark Cuban, Indy 500 winner Al Unser Jr., Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, and author and entrepreneur Robert Kiyosaki and many others. From a humble beginning as a young immigrant escaping war-torn Iran with his parents to founding his own company, Patrick has gained first-hand understanding of what rags to riches means and how it is fueled by freedom and opportunity, the core tenets of the American dream. Patrick calls Dallas, Texas home where he and his wife are raising their three children. Wow, let me catch a water break. That was an amazing introduction, Pat. And uh, 
appreciate you for doing all those things and um, love having you on the show here. But before we get started, I want to ask you a quick question. I have this, I, I, I believe it's the next billion dollar idea and I'd like to run it by you. Really? See if you want to do that. No, not really. Because I know that that is the question you hate to hear from people. People, quit coming up with these ideas and get to work. Stop focusing on, idea, on ideas, Pat says. Focus on sales. Pat, where'd you come up with that? So I, 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 uh, for me, uh, believe it or not, I'm more about coming up with a system in your mind that can help you constantly come up with ideas. Too many people cling on one idea thinking it's going to change the uh, face of one industry or whatever it may be. But the people that I know who uh, uh, constantly come up with ideas in their brain, they sit there and they, you can give them any industry. And any industry you give them, they go through data, they figure out, they do some research, and all of a sudden they'll say, these are nine things you can do to have your own breakthrough in that industry. So I'm all about you having a system for ideas rather than just getting excited about the idea that you have. But sales, you know, you, you talk about sales. Everything in the world is selling. Everything in the world is selling. That beautiful girl in high school dated the guy that was good at sales. If you look at the girls that date some men that don't look the best, it's because they know how to sell better than the pretty boy who doesn't need to learn how to sell. You know, the, the, our president today is a salesman. Our president prior to him is a salesman. Every single president we've ever had from 1 to 45, they're all great in sales. They're all great on communicating. Reagan was a great communicator. Clinton was a great communicator. Lincoln was a great communicator. You got to learn how to sell. So if, I, if I'm able to work with somebody directly, and if I can help them get the sales side going, they're probably going to end up having a great career no matter what industry they go into. And then they can come up with some great ideas. That's well said. I hope I uh, relieved you when I revealed my ploy to trick you with that uh, question there. Because I kind of saw it coming. The look on your face. I think you were reaching for your bayonet. <laughs> yeah, I saw it coming. Nice, nice, nice. Let's, let's go back to the beginning, if you would, though. You know, that's, it's quite a childhood for anyone to go through. And forgive me if, if uh, you know, this is a, a story that you've had to tell quite a bit. But, you know, when you were younger, can you talk about, you know, life growing up? And, and in particularly, you know, what, was there someone that was successful that, that you followed into business or into, you know, called performance lifestyle? No one in Iran. I didn't have anybody in Iran to look up to. I lived in Iran 10 years. Definitely nobody in Germany when we were at the refugee camp. But when I came here, I had a, you know how in the family there's always somebody called uncle, but it's not really your uncle. I had an uncle, his name was Uncle Luther. Luther, Luther. And uh, this man left uh, Iran, came to the States, made a lot of money, and every year I'd go to his house once, every year. Once a year, my dad would take me to his house. And he lived on a street called San Antonio in a city called Upland. And it was all the way at the top, called the sack, 7,200 square foot home. And you would enter to the right was his, was his library, his office. Then it was his bedroom with a jacuzzi. The left was a kitchen while everybody in the morning would meet in the kitchen and they would make food for each other. And then he had a living room with the pool table and a picture of him and Al Gore and a, a picture of all his family members dressed in white. And he would always sit there with his family and creating debates for no reason. And he would say, you know, I don't believe in God. And what if somebody says this about the Bible? And what if the person said this? And what if the president is right? What if the president is wrong? And what about this? And his kids would be all debating, all, always creating these debates. And um, once a year, I saw this guy. And my mother, she's, uh, 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 her family, they were all communists, all of them. They were all communists. They all believed their Bible was the Communist Manifesto. That's what they swore by. My dad's side, he believed in imperialism. And if you know imperialism and if you know communism, it is like far right, far left. I mean, you're talking about polar opposites. So the best debates of my career I've personally witnessed is not Trump against Hillary or, you know, Obama against Romney or any of those guys. The best debates was my mom and dad going at it over uh, communism and imperialism. So th that, kind of, uh, that kind of brought me up. And this entire time, my mother would say things about this rich man saying, you know, he's a bad guy. You know, he has all he cares about is money. All he cares about is money. So on one end, I had an example of a guy I looked up to. But on the other end, I didn't like him because he was rich because of what my mother said. 
And then eventually later on in life, he became one of my uh, sources of inspiration to go decide to become an entrepreneur. No kidding. Now, do you subscribe to that theory? Do you, do you create this maelstrom of debating activity in your, across your island and your, in your kitchen uh, with your children? All the time. All the time. Uh, uh, for me, for the first, uh, I don't know how many years, uh, probably just until uh, recent three years ago or two years ago, uh, I would have a lunch with my employees and my executives and the people I work with, and I would throw a topic up there and I would give both arguments and I would let them debate and they would go at it. And we learned so much from that. Uh, I do that with my salespeople, my executives, my peers, uh, with my kids, with my wife, with my family, with anybody. Thanksgiving dinner for us is pretty much four hours of debate. Uh, uh, but it's friendly debate. We're all trying to learn about, you know, what to do, what not to do. There's always so much, um, so many blind spots that we have. Everybody thinks for the most part they're right. You got to realize this. Most of us think we're right most of the time. That's a big blind spot because especially as you start winning more and you start making more money, you actually have a bigger blind spot because it's now being hidden by everybody around you that says how amazing you are. Oh my gosh, you're so amazing. You're so smart. You're so this. And you know, some people say that because they either work for you or they admire you or all that stuff. And so sometimes all the compliments in the world are not good for you when you start winning. Compliments are good for you when you don't believe in yourself. I don't know if compliments are good for you when you're winning a lot because it can really mess with your head. So I think debates uh, allows us to uh, kind of, you know, work on our blind spots that we have to get a little bit more clear. To, to answer your question for you, yes, we do that all the time. Yeah, I can, I can tell it's kind of a, like a, it's a personality thing. Um, you know, it's, your, it's part of your personality. Um, and I, I've done the same, and I, and I have my side of the family and my wife's side of the family. And let's just say that the debates are completely different <laughs> because one side is a particular way and the other one maybe doesn't embrace it as much. Here's a, here's a pretty big uh, question for you. You grow up in war-torn Iran, where you mentioned that you're hearing the whistles, incoming shells. I mean, like trauma beyond, you can't even understand it unless you've been through it. And then, dude, you join the Army. You join the U.S. Army. You, you escape that and then join the U.S. Army? How, how did that make sense at that time in your life? It really didn't make sense. But, uh, you know, uh, my mother uh, uh, was going back to Iran. And a recruiter had been recruiting me, Jesus Guerra. He's been recruiting me since I was 14. And uh, he kept asking me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because nothing about me was special. Like I, was, I never played organized sports. I want you to keep this in mind. I'm 6'4", 240, and I've never played organized sports. 6'4", 240, I've never played organized sports. Not football. I've never had a high school jersey on ever. Uh, I've never played organized anything. So for me... Uh, a one point eight GPA in high school, parents got a divorce. My mother didn't have $16.50 to pay for a YMCA membership. I mean, nothing. So I started working very early on at haagen At 14 years old, I lied on my birth date. I said, I'm 16. They hired me because I was tall. And so I had to figure out a way how to make money. And uh, so when the day came, when my mother said she's going back to Iran, she said, what are you going to do? You're going to come with me back to Iran? I said, no, you go back to Iran. I'll figure it out. I stayed here. And uh, one night I woke up and I just said, I'm going to go join the army. Very simple. And I went in the army. I went to Fort Jackson. I called my mom from uh, South Carolina. I said, listen, I'm in the army. Uh, I, I just want you to know I'm in. And I got 30 seconds to tell you I'm in. And the next time I saw my mom was seven years later. Wow. So when I was in the military, you know, it was funny because a lot of people would ask me, privates would ask me. You know, I've never seen a nose like yours before. <laughs> Why are your ears so big, man? Why do you have, you look different. Where are you from? And I'm, I'm from Iran. You're from where? I'm from Iran. Are you a U.S. citizen? I'm not. How are you in the Army? You can be. I have a green card, but I don't have, I'm not a U.S. citizen. So why are you in the Army? Finally, after fights, so many. I got into more fights my first week of, uh, uh, what is it before you go into boot camp? Not reception, reception battalion. Listen. I can't tell you how many times I got into a fight. One day, we had a terrible fight in the laundry room. Ugly. One of those ones that's like a bloodbath type of fights. And the drill sergeants, they pulled me aside. They said, listen, Private, this thing's not for you. 
and we're going to give you the phone. You can go make all the phone calls to your family. We think you should go out. It's not going to be dishonorable. It's just going to be less than honorable, meaning you were not in, you were not out, nothing started. You're going to be fine. General. General. And I went, uh, 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 I went and sat down with uh, my uh, uh, phone and I started calling all my friends. Everybody said, Pat, of course, get out. Everybody's asking, everybody's saying, you know, what's going on? That night I went to sleep. I had a bunk buddy. His name was Wiggins. I can tell you what music I was listening to that night. I was listening to uh, um, an album. Uh, uh, Usher had just come out with their album, uh, with his album, and, uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm just going through it. Uh, Black Street. And I'm just saying, I can't sleep, but I woke up in the morning, told the drill sergeants, I'm not getting out. I'm staying in. And I ended up staying in until today. One of the top five best decisions I ever made in my life was joining the U.S. Army. And I tell you, when I tell you one of the top five, like you have that American flag right there. If you come to my office and you see my setup, you would think like uh, this guy's a patriot at the highest level, um, but he's from Iran. How is an Iranian love America more than, more than most Americans do? It's a pretty weird situation, but uh, it was a pleasure being in the U.S. Army, one of the best decisions I made. Yeah, I, I echo that. And I, my oldest son is, is 19, and he's threatening to join the Navy in a couple of months. And I can't, I hope that he does it. I think it's the best thing going, uh, you know, you say it's the best thing that you've, one of the best things that you've, that you've done. Um, and we're going to talk about your opinions on college as well a little, little bit later, but do you think that we should have some kind of a, um, you know, call it mandated service for an 18 year old in America? I think if you're undecided, I, I meaning, let me explain what I mean by this. Um, if I'm, if I'm the president and if I am uh, 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 campaigning around something and I'm seeing what's going on here, um, I, would, I would put something in place for uh, men to have some kind of a boot camp experience. And I'll tell you why. Because I think uh, 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 men are extremely soft today. I think everything about TV, marketing, advertising is about how soft they are. Uh, everything's about making fun of men. It's like a... It's so weird what it is today. All of it is about making fun of men and this whole identity crisis that they're having where they don't really know what they're supposed to be. Am I supposed to be more feminine? Am I supposed to be softer? You know, nowadays when you say man's man, that comes out of being chauvinistic. What do you mean by being a man's man? But, you know, to me, I think uh, men need a little bit more discipline. So unless if a kid's got a 4.1 GPA, okay, and he's got a scholarship to go to, you know, USC, Florida State. Wharton, whatever it is, and he's all on his way there. He knows what he wants. He should go in. But the kid that's got, you know, 2.2 GPA and he has no clue what he wants to do with his life, he lacks discipline, maybe got a little bit into trouble, maybe send him to National Guard or send him to, you know, reserve, at least do the six month of boot camp and AIT to get, to get a little bit of discipline in him. And then if he wants to go be an active guard or active duty, great. If not, at least he got a little bit of dis discipline in his belt. But I am more for uh, boys joining the military today. Um, than ever before. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. I, I don't know if it's because it's validating what our choices were back then, but the benefits seem to just be so rich and, and they're not all just financial benefits. There's the intangibles, um, you know, that come along with that too. So, so from the military, you get, you come out, you get into business, but somewhere along the line, you started reading. When did you become such an avid reader and in particular, who in the world turned you on to this uh, ancient history and stoicism philosophy? August, August of 99. August of 99, when I got out of the Army, I started uh, uh, working for uh, a gym called Valley Total Fitness. I don't know if you remember when there was a Valley. You're, st you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Tell us a story about Fox Hills Mall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Fox Hills Mall, I'm working at Valley's, and uh, there – my sister recommended me a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And that changed my life. And then my sales manager, the boss I had, Robbie Solomon, recommended me How to Master the Art of Selling by Tom Hopkins. And those are the first two books I wrote, I read. I read those books. From there on, I couldn't believe it. I said, I cannot believe how much content is in these books. So, you know, from there on, that just became my absolute obsession about reading. And then Stoicism, you know, is a complete different reason why I like Stoicism. I like Stoicism because um, I think this man named Marcus Aurelius was a very unique man. You know, when you read Meditations, 
and he kind of talks about the body of his life, you know, what he did and what he learned from his grandpa and what he learned from his family, the mistakes, all this other stuff. And you realize that he lived by a philosophy of stoicism. And when he was in power for seven years, he had a slave that would sit behind him and always whisper in his ear, you're not as important as you think you are. You're not, you're not as important as you think you are. How was the emperor of Rome having a slave sit behind him and just whisper to him, you're not as important as you think you are. And that made him be a humble leader that ended up, you know, leading an army. So I think stoicism is a philosophy that helps in the world of business because not everything's going to go your way. And if you get too emotionally attached to some things that don't go your way, you are going to be miserable. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's, that's so, that, that is so pure and rich content. Uh, I really, I really appreciate it. It's becoming popular now because of, you know, some guys like yourself and Tim Ferriss that are kind of preaching it. And, uh, but it, it does make a, a really clear, um, you know, crystal clear. It makes clear, crystal clear sense when you think about it. You know, let, let me ask you one of your favorite questions. And I'll use the word 20 years instead of five to 10 years. But 20 years ago, did you think that you would be in the financial position that you're in today? 20 years ago, I was what, 20 years old? I was uh, just getting out of the army. Uh, no, absolutely not. 20 years ago, uh, what, I, what I did have is I was always a dreamer. I've always dreamt. Like it was always uh, dreaming about possibilities. Like if you and I were in high school together, uh, I was the guy that would, you know, would say, hey, if you had the choice of being the richest man in the world, if you had the choice of being the best basketball player in the world, if you had the choice of being the best general in the world, best actor in the world, best singer in the world, which one would you want to be and why? And that would, you know, lead up to all these conversations. If you had a million bucks, what would you do with it? And I, I spoke like this probably at 14, 15, because it was a dream. But there was not a single inclination of, or, or a sign where you would say, this guy's going places. Nothing. You would have never said it. Um, so going back to the question about, you know, did I think 20 years ago I'm going to be here today? Absolutely not. The only thing on my mind 20 years ago was women, nightclubs, party, <laughs> and bodybuilding. Literally, that was the only thing on my mind. Yeah, probably in that order too, right? Oh, yeah. You know, you know do you think that that, that, that um, call it talent or desire, um, to be, to be great was in you though. And it, and it emerged after you kind of checked the block on the chasing the women and the party. And, and, and for some reason, all of that stuff kind of, you check the block and shed it. So now the real interest and the real pursuit uh, that was inside of you was able to come to fruition through your businesses. Was that there or did something happen? And it kind of like redirected you onto a path that you're on now. Yes, I think everybody's got a, 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 a level of greatness in them. The way, the way I measure everybody is, is very interesting. I don't know if you've seen the video, How to Reach Your Full Potential. In that video, I talk about how everybody has a different level of capacity, meaning, you know, you could be, your capacity could be here, mine could be here, another person's could be here. So for you, you may be performing more than somebody else. Like, you know how some people just, have it come to them very easy. They're so smart. They're so brilliant. And they beat everybody and they think they're winning, but they're comparing themselves to the wrong class because everybody is below them. And then you have a guy that comes up or a couple that comes up or a woman that comes up that she doesn't have the biggest capacity. He doesn't have the biggest capacity, but the desire to want to compete is higher. So you become an overachiever for your life. So for me, I think uh, what caused that event uh, 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 was when my dad had a heart attack and I went to UCLA Medical Center and I saw my dad there uh, and he was, uh, uh, you know, lost 30, 40 pounds and they were mistreating him because it was a government facility. I lost it. They kicked me out. Cops came and kicked me out of the hospital. And uh, I told him, I said, you guys got to put my dad in a better room. This is my dad. I said, sir, you're in a government hospital. He's not paying for this. This isn't private. This is a uh, public. This is the uh, taxpayers are paying for this. So I went in the car, I cried like a little baby, and uh, I came out the next day, and no one would recognize me. I told every one of my friends, do not call me to go to a nightclub again. You're not going to get me. They didn't believe me. For six months, they called me. I told them, I said, stop calling me. I'm not going to the club with you. And it was over with. It, 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 the, the Patrick B. David of the next day of UCLA Medical Center versus the Patrick B. David of the day before, 
you would never recognize a two. Never. You would never recognize a two. Uh, uh, and that's why for me, when I saw what happened in my life, uh, I'm a big believer of that being able to happen to anybody's life. And, you know, a lot of times, if you look at the time we're living in today, you can go on YouTube today and search how to anything. You can go search how to sell annuities, uh, how to write a book, how to put a bow tie, you know, tie a bow, how to tie your shoelaces. There are so many how-to videos. But how-to doesn't move people. Why to is what moves people. That day, that night, it was all why to. It wasn't how-to. I figured why to, then the how-to came afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's inspirational. And uh, a lot of us have those kind of um, inflection points. Um, do, you, do you find it possible or is, is it possible to find someone and hire them before that happens to them? and then be able to hold on to them during that transition? Or can you bring it out of them without their tragedy having to be a tragedy? Can you inspire them through your leadership and bring out that fire? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. Listen, um, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if I were to ask you right now, give me the five deepest conversation you ever had uh, with folks, whoever these people are, that completely changed the way you looked at X, Y, Z you'd be able to come up with five conversations and you say, okay, it's one person was this, this person was this. Great. You know, you know, your brain immediately went to a few conversations. Okay. I think, um, you know, when you, when people ask the question, Pat, define leadership and you hear what, uh, one of them is what, you know, setting the example, you got to set a great example because leaders set an example. Okay, fine. Let's just say leadership set an example, but that is you. So leadership is two things. One is here. People look at you, you have moral authority. Okay, good. This guy's got it. I'll listen to him. You're in shape. I am willing to listen to how you got in shape. You made a few hundred million. I'm willing to listen to how you made a few hundred million. But then the other element of leadership is internal, external. External is how you get people to do things that they wouldn't do on their own. And great people know how to ask the right questions that pull the right information out. Think about it this way. If you and I were to, if you were to call me and you say, Pat, I want to run for office. I said, what do you mean? I want to run for office. What are you running for? Governor, president. Fine. You're running. Yes. Have we already talked to your wife? Yes. You sure? Yes. What does she say? She's supportive. Great. Who else? In-laws, family, everybody. You're in. You're hundred percent. I am. Great. Okay. You decide to run for office and you're going to run for president. It comes time for the first um, debate and you're sitting there at the panel with the Democrats or the Republicans, because you are first trying to win your side of the, you know, a Republican side or a Democratic side or an independent side or whatever side you're running for. And you got 10 people that you're debating. Why would you get nervous when you first go on stage? Why would you and I get nervous? We get nervous because we're going on stage and what are we thinking about? What if they ask those three questions that I don't want them to ask? What if they ask those three questions or a question that I don't have the answer to? And you're up there and the moderator says, question for you. This is what we're looking at. Pa, 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 pa. What do you think about this? You're stuck. You're startled. Okay. See, great leaders know how to ask those pointed questions that no one asks you to be able to pull out a side of you that you've never seen before. And then eventually you leave after the conversation with that leader and you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you asked me that question. So then you go home, you're laying, you're laying in bed, you can't sleep. You wake your wife up at one o'clock. You say, babe, you know what John asked me today? What did he ask you today? He asked me this question, babe. What do you think about it? I mean, I, I'm startled. I don't have an answer for it. Maybe he's right. Is he right? Am I really like this? Do I really think? That, I, I, don't, I don't know if he's right, babe. I don't know. If it, but maybe he is right. And then you're tossing and turning and all this stuff. After tossing and turning, one of two things happens. Either you go through your selective hearing and you say, no, 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 no. He has no clue what he's talking about. I'm not like that. It's not my fault. It's the world's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's this. Or you go and do self-reflection and you say, it is my fault. Then you move. So I believe great leaders that ask the right questions can move anybody if the right questions are asked. Wow. That's awesome. Um, can we ask, can we ask you about your agency? You know, you, you've built this agency and you, you, 
you lit the spark at the Fox Hills Mall just before quitting selling Bally's memberships. They said, you go to the mall and sell something. And something happened there to where you said, hey, I can do this. And you got a little confidence there. You graduated from that and got into the financial services business. And, um, and about 10 years ago, you decided to go out on your own and start PHP. Can you tell us about that decision and then kind of bring us up to date as to, you know, what does PHP look like today? Yeah, so uh, I started working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter day before 9-11 after leaving Bally's. And I got my 766, 31, 26. So I, I just kind of fully went into that side and, you know, things were going good. Business was going good for me. And then uh, uh, I left Morgan, went to Transamerica, and then I started really looking at the marketplace. Let me tell you a few events that really impacted my life on what these things were. One uh, was when Ron Paul raised $6 million in 24 hours on MySpace. He raised $6 million. A 70-year-old man raised $6 million in 24 hours on MySpace. It was a record. Guinness Book of World Record. Never happened before. Everybody said, how the hell did this happen? Well, maybe method of campaigning is changing. So guess who got inspired by that in 2004? A one-term senator from Illinois who goes and gives an incredible speech at DNC and becomes a spokesperson for Democrats. He becomes a two-term president, President Obama. And then our most recent president understands Twitter better than anybody else. He knows Twitter better than 18-year-olds know Twitter. And he's 72 years old. And he becomes a president, Donald Trump. So social media immediately told me, you can go out and build your own CBS, NBC, ABC, whatever you want. And you have to be able to control the narrative today. Because if you don't control the narrative, the media is going to control your narrative. They will tell the world who you are. So you got to be able to have a platform to tell the world who you are and what you stand for. So that was one side marketing. That gave me an edge to say, you can compete with the biggest companies in the world in insurance because here's where we are. Next. I took the formula and I said, okay, I have my 766, 31, 26 life and health. We sell VA, mutual funds, money under management, variable annuities, you know, a variable universal life, all these things. And I said, we're not going to sell everything. <coughs> if we sell everything, we're not going to have a niche business. My entire focus went on, we eliminated BD. We're not dealing with BD. That's very understandable. <laughs> I'm not dealing with BD. Even though we have a BD for a, a few people, but we're not dealing with BD. We're not dealing with securities. And we're going to be specific to insurance and annuities. And then our target market, the average agent was a 59-year-old white male. We're not doing that. I'm going pure uh, multicultural. Uh, we're 11% Caucasian in our company today. We are 51% Latino. The average agent in the company today is a 34-year-old Hispanic woman. Let me say this again. 34-year-old Hispanic female in our company is the average agent. Our number one earner is a woman. If you were to come to our, come to our convention last year in August, the uh, entertainment of the evening was Kevin Hart. Kevin probably dropped a couple hundred F-bombs, which is not nice for a lot of people. And that's not our environment. We're not like getting up on stage and cursing and all this stuff. It's not how we are, but we also don't mind being edgy. Like we're not trying to be, you know, uh, 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 you know, a very square type of company because you're just not going to be able to attract the millennials that you want. If you want to attract an audience, you got to create an environment that attracts that audience. A lot of times, you know, people want to attract an audience, but they're dressing like a completely different audience they want to attract, or they're talking a language. Your language, your behavior attracts the audience. It's very simple. No matter what you do, you're going to attract that audience. So I wanted the middle uh, America. I wanted the multicultural audience. I wanted the young, hip, uh, our guys. They'll come. They'll dress up. You'll see these guys. They, it doesn't look like an insurance conference at all. So from there, we grew it from one office in Northridge, California with 66 agents to today we have 9,800 agents in 49 states. Um, De La Hoya is one of our investors. Uh, Gabriel Breno, who owns the Houston Dynamo, is one of our investors. Adelaya Fund out of New York, uh, that is a $2 billion fund, is another one of our investors. You can pull it up on Crunchbase PHP Agency to read, a, read about it. And then we just announced our next conference that'll be July 29th to August 2nd in Vegas, Mirage. The capacity to the place is 8,500 people. 
We sold out of the conference five months before the event. We've sold 10,300 tickets at $200. Five months before the event, it's completely sold out. This will be the craziest event we've ever had. But again, going back to it, I got very clear about the niche I wanted to go after, and that became what I saw for. And we put the blinders for this, and we didn't look around. We just said, this is where we're going, and that helped us build, us, build our agency to where we're at today. Yeah, you've mentioned in some of your work uh, the blue ocean theory, and that's exactly, you know, you, bas- you basically, you, I mean, maybe, maybe these guys saw you and wrote the book because you started that back in the early 2000s. The book didn't come out until 2004, 2005. Um, so some, somewhere there was some synergy going on there. And, um, you know, you've also mentioned, though, uh, about having a side hustle and about having uh, not necessarily multiple streams of income, but, ha- but having a little, you know, part-time side hustle. It, it, has your opinion changed from the blue ocean or is it, uh, is it just, just a little bit of a development? Yeah, I, I think it's, all, it's more about what you want to do. I mean, how big you want to scale your business. You know, if you... If you want to make, um, if you want to make a, a hundred million dollars, if you want to make ten million dollars, you only start a side hustle to end up making it your full time hustle, and you drop your job to do that full time. You know, but if you're trying to make a couple thousand dollars a month, everybody's got to have a side hustle. I mean, everybody here's got to have something to do. If the aspiration is only to pay off your debt or have an additional couple thousand dollars. Uh, for income, you know, you could, do go, you could go do real estate with that. You can do insurance. You can do digital marketing, affiliate marketing to make a couple thousand dollars a month. That's not hard to do. But if you do want to build an empire, I mean, you have to be all in into one thing. See, I, I'm not a, a t- in today's world, you will hear a lot about multiple streams of income. I think it's one of the biggest myths of multiple streams of income. It confuses a lot of people because this whole idea about multiple streams of, streams of income is often sold too early, meaning I'm coming up, I'm doing four different things, and I'm barely making 70 grand a year. I don't need multiple streams of income, not too many of them. If my goal is to make millions, I have to have one completely, fully undivided attention to one industry to be able to make it scale. So I'm all about the blue ocean concept we're talking about if your vision is big. And I'm all about the side hustle if your vision is just to make a couple bucks per month on top of your uh, uh, full-time job that you have. It all depends. The most important question you got to answer is who you want to be and what life you want to live. If it's big, you got you to be selling out to one. If it's just a basic, small, content life, then that's a different story. Yeah, I've heard it be referred to as a, as a chicken entrepreneur. And even myself personally, you know, I'm kind of, I've experienced this a bit to where I, I kind of wound up in a career because I was told by someone or some people that that's what I should be doing. Like that was what you're supposed to do, but it wasn't my passion. So the way for me to transition is to build that side hustle, which is passion based, which is make it big based as you're saying. And then when the, when the, when the, the, like the locks, when the boat fills up the water enough to float, then you can, then you can roll with it. So you've launched another leaf onto your tree though, this value tainment which I believe you launched it uh, three, maybe four, three years ago, 2016, right? Maybe 15. Mm-hmm. And um, remarkable, just, just, I mean, it's, it's so good. If, if, if the audience here of wholesalers and financial planners, if you only do one thing from this episode, check out Valuetainment on YouTube. Get your, get your popcorn ready. Get your popcorn ready because you're going to have bags like me because look at me. I've been up all night for a couple of days now consuming this content, it is that rich. Um, even if you're way ahead of me, <laughs> it's still going to give you a lot to look at and to really uh, absorb. We're talking about interviews with Ben Shapiro. We're talking about Jordan Peterson. That's very popular. Those guys are popular right now. Uh, I saw your interview with Mark Cuban on Valuetainment, and maybe I was wrong, but it didn't look like you guys were broing out. It looked like it was a little uncomfortable a few times you, you said, well, we can put that to the side for now and kind of an, an attempt to move it along. Maybe you caught Mark on a bad day. I don't know. But I appreciate your efforts in doing that. I know how difficult it is to produce a, a podcast and uh, to do that interview kind of a procedure like that. I think sometimes, sometimes uh, when, when an interview is done and you think it's just going to be the typical, what are the keys to success? You know, what are this? And then you get asked tough questions and he's not used to that. 
uh, uh, your, your, your cutoff card and you don't like that, but uh, it is what it is. I, I like tough questions. So that's why we had an interesting time together. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I enjoyed that one. Which is your favorite episode of all the shows you've been on or the guests that, the guests that you've interviewed on your show, uh, whether it's for value attainment or, or, or not, what has been your, you know, kind of most memorable or your, your favorite episode? I, first of all, uh, Brian Rose interviewed me in London. I thought he was amazing. You mentioned his name earlier. He's a great interviewer, phenomenal interviewer. I like that a lot. Uh, but as far as interviewing, Michael Francis and I have created a very strong bond together. Uh, uh, that one ended up getting uh, uh, millions of views. I think the main one got 6.2 million. Translated in Russian got another couple million. And then the next one got two or three million. So it's 10 million views on uh, two interviews with him. Uh, he was very interesting about how he was a highest paid mobster back in the days, 80s, made a couple billion dollars. John McAfee, uh, the McAfee antivirus founder guy, he is as weird as it can get. When we arrived to his house, there were five ex-Navy SEALs with AK-47s uh, in their arms with nine German Shepherds. And I'm doing the meeting with, he had a gun right next to him while conducting the interview in the middle of the interview. Somebody knocked on the door. They jumped to the door with a gun. It was, it was so, and, and it's in the video, by the way. You see literally in the video, the guy goes to the door with a gun. And uh, that was pretty wild. But uh, yeah, every, you'll typically know my interviews, who I'm interested in and who I'm not, if it lasts more than 45 minutes. If it's, if it's less than 45 minutes, I can't wait to get out of there. If it's more than 45 minutes, there are some interviews I do that just, I go in with a higher, oh my gosh, this thing's going to be amazing absolute flop, boring, nothing exciting. And I'm just being honest with you. And then some people you interview, you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was going to, like for instance, I just did an interview. The interview ended up being an hour and 51 minutes. It was crazy, uh, the amount of things we talked about. But uh, regardless of it all, I'm uh, extremely curious about people. So when I'm doing interviews, I'm typically going into some areas and questions that uh, you know maybe they haven't touched up on. So we have fun with that. Yeah, I, I enjoy watching your interviews. And the, the Brian Rose, you know, Brian, I took one of his courses a year ago. And so I sat in that chair that you sat in. I went through the interview process with him and met him. And uh, he's an interesting fellow. Um, lots of good things about him. You know, and everyone has their their uh, facets that maybe others don't appreciate. Yeah. Um, not not that you and I would, but, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Any, any memorable moments uh, that you shared with Brian uh, that, that you can share with us? Yeah, it was a lot of things. I mean, he, uh, he was able to bring stuff out of me. Uh, it was good. We had a good time together with Brian. Um, you know, it, 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 why I don't drink alcohol or do drugs, why well, I'm not a fan of that, uh, why I believe in capitalism, you know, why I think entrepreneurship and marriage and having kids been oversold. You know, so many people are uh, having kids or getting married without knowing why they're having kids and why they're getting married because everybody's having kids and everybody's getting married. And so many people want to become entrepreneurs thinking it's going to be an incredible life and they don't realize that it is not easy, man. Marriage is not easy. You know, having kids is not easy. It's a lot of hard work. So, uh, but, but it, was, it was a good conversation. You know, everyone's got a different style of interview and everyone does. The part that I respect is just look at yourself right now. You're conducting the interview. I respect when the interviewer researches when they're sitting down. Because that is, the, that is the highest level of respect you can give your guest. It's very obvious you did research. Very obvious. That shows your sign of professionalism. And so that, to me, is somebody that's going to be able to be in this game long term because they're professionals. The ones that wing it and they're doing questions like, so tell me the keys to this and tell me that. It's like, listen, change it up a little bit. Ask a few different <laughs> a little bit more research. And uh, going back to you, you you're, you're doing a fantastic job because you've done proper research for yourself. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I think that our military background, you know, kind of stemmed that for me a little bit, you know, reconnaissance and kind of knowing my audience. And, you know, with that, the, the wholesalers that are on the show, they're going to really appreciate a couple of your major points. And I can just read them to them, but it comes, comes across better when, when you can tell us about it. You know, you've quantified these, you call them the three most important position in sales. The three most important positions. The first one's the finder. Second one's the closer. The third one is a developer. Now, you know what wholesalers do. Can you tell us about those three a little bit? But before you start, Pat, t tell us, I mean, is it a unicorn? Is someone a unicorn if they possess all three of these? 
Yes. Let me ask you this. I got a question for you. The wholesalers that are on, these are wholesalers that are with companies like Allianz, Prudential, where they're going around finding business. Okay. So I can talk about wholesaling on a whole different level. Okay. I'll tell you my favorite wholesaler of all time. Okay. And what he did. He works for me now, just so you know. He works for me and his wife, who was the former chief operating officer of Pack Life, she's now my chief operating officer. Uh, for 22 years, she was with Pack Life. She's now with me. So let's talk about wholesalers. What made him so special? So uh, Greg Turlucky, uh used to be with AIG for many years. He started working with us, and Greg used to be a baseball player back in the days. He was a pitcher, the first professional pitch he ever threw. He threw to Pete Rose. So you got he comes from the uh, old-timer guy, and uh, he played with old-school guys. And so that's how his career got started. Baseball then went into insurance. He built an FMO, sold the FMO, and then he decided to go be a wholesaler, and that's what he did for his career. When we first started doing with AIG, business with AIG, this was post 08, 09, 2010. So think about AIG's reputation. No one wants to be called AIG. AIG didn't call themselves AIG. AIG called themselves Sun America, American General, anything but AIG, right? Even their executives were being told, stop calling us AIG. No one's buying policies. Perfect. Then they hire a guy named Bob and Moshe. Bob and Moshe was a product from MetLife. Bob is a godfather of life insurance. The guy's a legend. He used to work at MetLife with another guy named Joe Jordan and a few other guys. They bring Joe, uh, Bob and Moshe. He has cancer. He's about to die. He's got terminal cancer. Everyone knows it, but he's kind of trying to keep it on a down low. He's at his uh, vineyard in uh, Croatia, Dubrovnik. He takes the job, AIG. Brings up a CFO, David Herzog. David Herzog used to be a CFO of American General. He promotes David Herzog. And they bring him on board. So these guys go on to raise $183 billion from the government. They ended up paying him back with $22 billion of interest. It ends up becoming a great story. Greg Turlucky, they decide to do business with, with us. Uh, we decide to do business with them. Both of us at that time needed each other. And uh, every time I called one of my offices, he was at the office. Every time. Every single time. He was, I said, what's he doing there? Oh, he just brought some... Uh, you know, a, a, a pie. He used to bring this pie. He was known for a pie. I you know some people bring cookies or whatever. He would bring a pie. Oh, he brought a pie. What else did he bring? He just brought a pie and he sat down and talked to me. He always remembers your anniversary. He always remembers your kids' birthdays. He always remembers your, your birthdays. You always got something. He always sent you stuff. He always delivered on his stuff. He always held his uh, commitments. If he said he's going to be somewhere, he showed up. Always professional. A conceptual salesperson, meaning he taught concepts constantly, uh, never bashed competitive carriers. He always said, <coughs> you know, it is what it is. That's a product for that. This is what we specialize in. And uh, he gained so much from me over the years. Now, let me give you the opposite side of a wholesaler. We had a wholesaler. I want to uh, give you his full name, but let's call him Frank. Okay. Uh, Frank. Uh, was a guy who was very good at premium financing. He understood the game of premium financing, big cases, you know, the whole technical part of premium finance. So if you needed somebody to come in for the close, he was good, but not good for volume. He was not good with newer people. He was not good with uh, working with agents that needed help, lacked patience. He just wanted to work with people that were going to give him a $6 million phase or something like that. Well, the insurance company didn't know about what this guy was doing. His responsibilities was to be active. Never showed up. He just, he would send you to games without going to the games. It's like, hey, you want to go to a Clippers game? Yeah, here's tickets. Go. So it was <laughs> relationship. It was like, I'm supposed to send you stuff. I'm supposed to do all this stuff, but I really don't want to do the work. But I'm hoping you realize that I appreciate you. It's fake. It's not real. And all the field people realized it was fake. Finally, I made a phone call to the carrier and I said, hey, you guys are either going to fire him or we will never do business with you ever again. If this guy touches my account one more time, he's fired. I'm not working with you guys. Two months later, the guy got fired and he was gone. So in the wholesaler war world, there's a lot of money involved. You do it right. You are protected forever because remember, this is very important for wholesalers. The FMO or the agent or the agency or the IMO builds a stronger relationship with the wholesaler than a carrier. Very important to realize that. Builds a stronger relationship with the FMO because he, the agency, the FMO, the agent, is typically talking to who more? Executives of an insurance company or the wholesaler? The wholesaler, okay? So 
what eventually happens is if the wholesaler does a lot right, he's permanently protected. If you go to Pru, it doesn't matter. You're going to call up your FMOs. If you go to Allianz, if you go to PAC, if you go to Nationwide, if you go to NLG, if you go any company, you're going to be able to call up on the prior FMOs because they remember how you did business. So wholesalers have to realize that the job they have uh, is so much about relationships, man. It's so much about relationships and knowing that not all FMOs are the same. Some FMOs just want you for big cases. Some FMOs just want you to help them close a few deals. Some FMOs want you to help out package the whole thing before it goes to the carriers. But some FMOs are a volume. And, and you have to know which one you fit the most and you bring value to them. So when you're talking about the finder, closer, developer, and the unicorns for an FMO, uh, for wholesalers, you know, uh, finders are generators. Those are who know how to generate business. That's not the wholesaler's strength, by the way. Wholesaler is working with finders. The agents are the finders. They're not, wholesaler's not the finder. That's not his job, right? Then you got the closer, which the wholesaler can help, you know, improve with closing, skills, all that stuff. But the wholesaler's responsibility is hardcore the developer. And the developer is the, is the relationship builder. If there is a number one skill set a wholesaler can master is relationship building. It is so critical for wholesalers to develop stronger relationships. Unfortunately, most wholesalers treat uh, relationships like one night stands and they come, they show up, hey, it's awesome, we love you guys, boom, you never hear from them ever again, okay? And that's the fastest way to get a, 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 an agency or an FMO to say, we're not dealing with this wholesaler. But those who do it right, you will have a long, very safe, protective career making a few hundred thousand dollars per year. And eventually, if you want to move up, you could because a lot of these guys end up becoming, you know, uh, 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 chief distribution officers and their salaries get to the seven figure, multi seven figure. If you go to one of these bigger insurance companies, uh, if they do it right. So the, the, the guy that thinks he can do all of it, they think he can be the, the finder who's good at getting the leads, a rainmaker, if you would. Um, they can also be the closer and then the developer. That, that's, I think that's naive to think that you can do all of those. I think it's really smart if you add team members that can be synergistic and complement that. You know, in one of your videos, Pat, you said that the finder is the most important of the three. And the reason why, well, why don't you tell us, why is the finder the most important of the three positions? In, in a salesperson, or in, the, uh, in sales, finder, can developer. I, can I be very upfront with your wholesalers? Yeah. If a wholesaler was a finder, he would have never been a wholesaler. Boom. Done. Very simple. Okay? <laughs> if a wholesaler was a finder, he would have never been a wholesaler. Why would he be a wholesaler? There's more money on finding than wholesaling. But it's a pain in the ass. Who the hell wants to be a finder? Honestly, think about it. No. 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 You know what a wholesaler does? Hi, I'm with AIG. I'm a wholesaler. Here are 73 FMOs. Call on them. They're, that's not finding it. They found it already for you. You're just calling on them. Now, I want you to realize this. I'm not knocking the wholesaler. So I don't want the wholesaler to say, Pat just took a shot at me. That's not what I'm saying. By, by the way, if you can tell, I just got passionate about these wholesalers because I have a lot of experience working with these wholesalers and many of them are very annoying. And some of them that are very good, I love and respect them. I invite them to weddings, birthday parties, because they are so important. So important. By the way, both Greg and Alice that are here, they have shares in a company. Company gets acquired, bot goes public. They're participating in that because I have so much respect for them. Very, very uh, high level of respect for them. So going back to it, going back to it. So finders are so important because the ability to find takes a lot of work takes a lot of watering relationships, takes a lot of uh, overcoming that level of trust, takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. And so that's why every time I found a finder that worked with me, I I'm a finder myself because, you know, to build a business, I'm, I'm, I have to be a finder. I wasn't a finder originally, but I learned how to be a finder. It's not an easy skill set to learn because it's a lot of work, but I had to learn how to be a finder. Eventually, I became a good finder. But I, I am a closer and I'm a developer. So the moment you learn, if you look at all those three, no one's going to be like 999. You're just not going to be 999. That sounds like Herman Cain's campaign, but you're not going to be 999, you know, a high, right? You're probably going to be like a, a four, a nine, and a three. 
but some of them you can take higher. Some of them are natural to you, but some of them you can improve it. Finding is, finding to me is a skill that if you learn how to find, uh, put it to you this way, okay? A lot of people right now are concerned about the economy. What direction are we going? Oh, you have to be worried about, you know, artificial intelligence because it could replace your job. You know, oh, you have to worry about this. You have to worry about that. Look, in the financial world that we're a part of, or any other world, but let's just say financial world, if you want to be irreplaceable, <laughs> let me say this again, if you want to be irreplaceable, meaning you're a linchpin, no one can replace you, you are desperately needed. If you learn how to be a finder, you are permanently needed, permanently. Unfortunately, most wholesalers are replaceable. It's just kind of how it is. And those few that are irreplaceable, carrier rarely gets rid of them. They keep them because they know how important they play. Because they know those handful of wholesalers, they have such deep relationships with places that if they fire them, they're screwed. They're probably going to take a 30% hit. So they sit there and say, this guy wanted a raise. What are we paying him last year? He made 380. Give him a new bonus comp structure. If he does it right, he'll get 600 this year. That big of a raise? Yes, because that 220 is worth more than us losing 6 million. Give him the 220. It's the, it's the basic math about being a finder. So again, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's, that's how I view finders. Yeah, it actually is. It's really helpful. Um, you mentioned before that there's no real system to develop a finder. It's almost, it's almost a, um, something that you're born with or you've developed over your, your development as a human. Closers, you can be taught. Yeah. These are the six most frequently, you know, objections that are raised. And then if this guy raises this objection, his wife says these seven things. And so you can have a nice schematic of, of great, I mean, Tom Hopkins quality rebuttals to each of them to walk them down the closing. Thing. And then you're like a robot. You show up, hi, but then you walk them down the funnel and, and that's a closer. That's what a lot of wholesalers try to gravitate to. And that's why there's a lot of turnover in the business. I agree with you when you say that the irreplaceable skill for a wholesaler is to be this developer, is to be what I call the relationship nurturer. You know, being married for a long time requires a lot of that nurturing. And it's not always pretty. It's not always easy, but it is always going on. And I think that you've mentioned before that in sales and even in entrepreneurship, there's not a lot of development going on. Everybody is in it for the quick buck, the low hanging fruit. So there is some finders, but a lot of closers. Everybody's just trying to find out the new technique on how to close or how to trick or how to trap someone. So wholesalers, if you're listening, Pat is saying to be, not to become the best finder, but if you can be a finder, be one. And if you're the guy that's not that, be the developer, be the nurturer, make yourself a linchpin to success between the company you represent and its clients. That is job security. Is that what you're saying, Pat? Absolutely. You know, leadership is a big deal. Um, a lot of folks are, are trying to run these sales teams and there's different structures. There's the old school mentality. There's the the guy that's a solopreneur, he tries to do it all. And those other ones that have an internal wholesaler, then they have a scheduler, then they have a client services department. Across the board, it's, it, it, there's 10 different ways you can do it. But as a leader, for these divisional managers and, and national sales managers that are on there, I want to introduce them to what you call the 90-10 rule. And this is the rule where you talk about the amount of effort that you put into, um, you call them a killer in the office. Can you talk about that a little bit and why the 90-10 rule is so important and effective? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if you go to, uh, say a company has three wholesalers, they'll typically have one that is superior to the other two by a mile. And those that don't, believe it or not, don't perform as good as those who do. Meaning, uh, I don't know why uh, so many people or insurance companies do not want to have one very strong uh, 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 individual that's uh, getting them to go out there and do very well because what if, you know, what if to worry about this guy replaces me and what if he does all this other stuff? See, earlier you asked me a question when you said about ideas and I said, it's not about the ideas to me. It's about creating a system of ideas. Like I'll give you a perfect story here and maybe this will resonate with your audience. And then after that, I, I, I'm looking at the clock. If we can go 10 more minutes, I'm good. So, you know, I remember when we first got started, okay? We started an insurance company, PHP. A lot of people from my uh, agency were coming up to me and they were saying the following. They were saying, 
Hey, Pat. I said, yes. Uh, man, uh, what, how do we go recruit people away from New York Life? And how do we go recruit people away from, you know, this company and farmers and state farm? And I had this very, <laughs> this is a meeting I had that they talk about till today. Okay, till today. And I had a meeting. I said, emergency meeting at the office tonight at 10 o'clock. Everybody showed up. And we sat down. And my main guys were there. I said, gang, let me put it to you this way. I said, number one, if you and I cannot take a greenie and help that greenie become successful in the world of sales, you don't deserve anybody to come to you from New York Life Farmers anywhere else. Why would they come to you? Because you don't know how to develop greenies. You just know how to steal. We're not in the stealing business. We don't need to steal other people's business. Why? I said, I don't mind attracting. I have a problem with stealing. What's the difference? Let me explain to you what it is. Very simple. I said, I want us to create a system that we have that develops leaders in such a proven way that everybody wants to come here because they want to learn about the system. Not because we give a bigger comp or leads or all this other stuff. There's nothing special about you if you're given a bigger comp or leads. Nothing special about you if you're given comp or leads. You're replaceable by the next guy that gives better leads and better comp. You're gonna, they're going to leave you for comp. If somebody marries you just because you're a billionaire, the day you lose your billion, she's going to go marry the next billionaire. Just kind of how things work out. Very simple, right? Because it's money driven. But if it's system driven, value driven, principle driven, ethics driven, a process driven that can be transferred to Awesome Mike, now we're winning. If I can take that knowledge and transfer it to you, now we're winning. So going back to the wholesalers. So this fear of what if I lose my best wholesaler to another company? No problem. But generally, when you go back and you talk to a lot of these insurance people that are wholesalers today, they'll generally tell you a company back in the 80s that developed the best wholesalers. They'll say, oh my gosh, you know, this company, you know, the best people come out of this company. Or they'll say things like, Xerox produces the best salespeople because Xerox is known as a great sales program, right? Anybody that worked at Xerox, you're going to come out learning how to sell or IBM sales program is sick if somebody goes through IBM's sales program. See, I'm not trying to steal IBM's salespeople. I'm trying to be IBM. I'm trying to be Xerox. I don't know if that makes sense. Focus so much more on developing the right leaders that everybody wants to work around you because you produce leaders. And then the 90-10 rule becomes, if I decide the next person I'm locking onto is Awesome Mike, 90% of my time is dedicated to developing Awesome Mike. What are the things we're doing? Today, I'm at the doctor's appointment. I'm doing some x-rays and some uh, pulmonology testing this morning. And I'm in the waiting room for one hour talking to one of my guys out of Hollywood, Florida. And we're having a lengthy conversation. And the conversation we were having is about how to run a sales office and handling rent with your agents. How do you have that conversation? Because sometimes it's like, you haven't paid the office rent and you're late. Yeah, but the guy's thinking to himself, man, I'm going through tough times and I'm one of your best people. You make money off me. Like, how do you have that tough conversation? There's a way of having that conversation. So I'll put time in an individual that's got the upside. It's those small conversations that is not in a manual. But if I can transfer that over to an awesome mic because he's showing dedication, I'm going to have a linchpin long term. And I'm going to make sure that that guy represents our company properly. And we end up winning because the system develops the right leaders. Not because I'm trying to steal people from another company that has a good system that develops leaders. I want to create systems. Yeah, that's awesome. You, you mentioned before, uh, you can either be a king or you can be a king maker. And that 90-10 system is exactly that. It's the maker of kings that are there. Hey, I know, I know we're cutting it close to the time here. So I want to ask you some, um, maybe some more, more deeper questions. The uh, first one is, um, you mentioned that the best thing that can happen to you, to a, to a young man, I think you said in, in particularly, young in his life is a heartbreak or a substantial failure. Can you tell us about that a little bit and maybe even share yours with us? Yeah, I mean, no doubt. I mean, uh, 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 when, when you lose early, <laughs> when you lose late, you're not used to losing. You know, when you lose early, you're kind of like, okay, this was painful. And you realize that you have to improve. You realize that, look, you're not as good as you think you are. You're not as great as you think you are. And the way you respond to that loss now is going to develop you into the next layer of a human being you could be. And so when that happens, just because somebody had a big uh, hitting rock bottom early, doesn't guarantee success. The reason why I say hitting rock bottom early is because 
Everyone in the world is watching to see how you're going to respond. Very simple. My kid, we're at a park one time. This was three years ago. And he was four years old and a six-year-old was bullying him. He was pushing him around. And my wife sitting next to me says, what do, what do you want to do? I said, no, leave it, leave it. See how he's going to handle himself. Leave it. And I'm watching him. Leave it, babe. Leave it. Babe, but look what he's doing. Leave it for a second. He's watching and watching and watching. Which, boom. Awesome. Okay, cool. Good for him. Didn't need him. But I watch him get bullied a little bit. Okay. Then there's a few things I teach my kids. And I'll explain both of them to you. One of them is there's four things we do as the Bed David family. We lead, we respect, we improve, we love. We don't bully, but we also don't get bullied. It's very simple. We don't bully and we don't get bullied. Then the four things we pray for at night are courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. We ask God for courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. Each for a specific reason. I'll tell you a story about what happened last week. Last week, my son, uh, my wife calls me and says, uh, the soccer coach just kicked Patrick out of practice. Hmm, really? What do you mean? Yeah, because he punched a kid in the face. I said, he punched a kid in the face. Let me talk to him. So she puts him on speaker. I said, did you punch him in the face? He starts crying. Yes, but he punched me in the stomach first. Now, my oldest son doesn't lie. So this guy's not a guy that's a marketer. He's just kind of like, he has so much pride that he's going to tell you what happened, right? So I said, okay. So you're saying you didn't hit him in the, you didn't hit him first? No, he punched me in the stomach first. I called the soccer place, the owner. I said, I need to talk to the owner. Owner picks up. I said, what, what the hell just happened today? So you just kicked my son out of practice. What happened there today? Well, sir, he punched the kid in the face. Did you see it? No, we didn't see the whole thing. We only saw some. Him punch. I said, did you see my son getting punched in the stomach? No. Do you have videos? Yes. I need you to watch it and call me back. So they watch a video. I said, if my son is wrong, he has a problem with me. But if you're wrong, you also have a problem with me. So the problem's either going to be you or him, but one of you guys is going to have a problem with me. So they watch the video. They call me back. They, 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 he calls back. He says, sir, I just want to let you know your son is right. The other kid punched him in the stomach first, then your son reacted and punched him in the face. We apologize. I said, I said, Dominique, an apology to me means nothing. You need to apologize to my son. I'm going to bring him back, and I'm bringing him to practice. My wife brought him, but this time I'm bringing him to practice. So I go to practice yesterday, and I show up. I had a board meeting, and I changed the whole board meeting to go to this place. And I go to him. <clears throat> my son's next to me. So they come. Uh, my, uh, Coach Luis, I say, hey, Patrick, I just want you to know, last week we saw the video of you punching him, and he punched you first. You were right. We wanted to apologize to you. Do you accept our apology? We do. But at the same time, I want you to know it's not appropriate for you to punch other people. Then I looked at my son. I said, listen, you got a great coach. Go listen to everything he's got to tell you. He's your coach. So he went and practiced. Coach and I have a great relationship now. What's the moral of the story here? <clears throat> these are moments where we're being built into leaders. You know, these are moments that we are having an opportunity to become a possible leader in the future. You know, these are opportunities where maybe the guy got embarrassed in front of his peers. He's being kicked out of practice among six different kids. That stays with a kid. So that moment he has an opportunity to be learning what took place. It's a character building opportunity. So when I say things like hitting rock bottom could be the best thing that can happen to you, it could, depending on how you respond. It could be the worst thing that happens to you, depending on how you respond. But if you, like one time, I took a paper and pen and I wrote out why I'm wired the way I am. Pat, why do you have a temper? Why do you have a temper? Why do you snap? Like 20, like... People think I have a temper today. At 23 years old, I mean, I was a nuclear bomb. I would walk around and bam, there goes Bed David. Watch what's going to happen now. Crazy. Just absolute stupid stupidity. Some of the stuff that would happen. So I asked, where's the temper from? And I went through all these things. Why, why do you have such a big chip? What's the story? Question, 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 question. I cannot tell you how much I learned about myself just by going deep on those questions. I realized, I said, okay, this why do you have these people you're being a jerk to? They didn't do anything to you. Relax. What are you doing? It's not a way to live. You, you think you're living the right way? You think you're going to maintain strong relationship? This is absolutely ludicrous. you got to change yourself. So I had to, after not having learned from hitting rock bottom, I had to go and have an inspection of myself of an event that took place 10 years ago or eight years ago and say, this is why you behave the way you do. we got to change it because this way you ain't going to win. And I started adjusting. So again, uh, I'm a big fan of watching people hit rock bottom and watching how they come out of it. And if I'm in their lives, I'll just try to tap them a little bit. But I want you to take ownership of the improvement, not me. Because if I take ownership, then you always think you need me. I don't want you to think you need me. I just want to kind of 
direct you by asking questions and you develop it, then you own it. So that means permanently you'll be able to do that on your own. So I don't know if that answers your question for you, but that's the part about hitting rock bottom. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And uh, makes, you know, the simplicity of it is to do it early so you can learn how to recover. But there's a lot more to it than just that. Last question, and, and I'll let you, let you go. Uh, and, and I hope this is not um, uh, in line with the wristband you have on and the little cough you do. But uh, you, you had a little bit of an, uh, an epiphany. One time you got sick right before Thanksgiving. You couldn't speak. You went and saw your favorite performer, Dariush. Yep. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I have like a Motown affinity. So like Al Green and the, the Commodores gets to me like that. He gets to you. And uh, you went and, and took care of that. And, and the, the, way, the way that you came back with this idea was, you know, he told you to make sure that the young wolf, the young wolf inside of you takes care of the future old wolf. Well, can you elaborate on what you're doing? What, what are you doing now as a young, younger wolf? to prepare for your 75 year old, 80 year old, older wolf. You know, it's crazy. Um, uh, when I heard that uh, uh, quote by Daryush, I was startled. I mean, I, I got to, when I heard that, I'm just saying, I had just come out of the procedure, I was startled because, you know, uh, think about it. Like I always say, your age lies if you look at the palm of your hand, right? But it doesn't lie if you look at here. You can tell the wrinkles here when you look at it. You can just tell. You can tell how old you are. It doesn't lie, never lies, right? This. This part, we look young. Everybody looks young here. But I just turned 40 four months ago, right? I'm 40 years old. Okay. Just yesterday, I was 23 years old. Just yesterday, I was in high school, 16 years old. How the hell am I 40? You know, and I used to be the younger guy in the crowd. I'm not today. I'm, I'm 40. But, you know, maybe in my own space of social media influencers, I'm still young because everybody is the uh, 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 content creator. You know, 90% of them are older than me. They're in their mid-40s, 50s, or early 40s. But again. I'm 40. How did this take place? I think sometimes we forget how fast we age. And the fact that, you know, if you sit there and think about yourself more from the 70 year old version of you, what is the 70 year old version of you need you today? What would your level of urgency be today if you knew what the 70 year old version of you was counting on you with? You know, I don't, I don't, I sit there and I, I myself, like I just bought a watch. It's an 80, $81,000 watch. I bought a Patek Felipe watch, right? And the reason why I bought it is because when I was in Paris, uh, the lady, it's the first time where they sold me the right way. For 10 years, I've never seen value in buying a Patek Felipe watch. And everybody knows about, you know, this watch. It's the sexiest watch. It's number one luxury, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what you got to buy. One of them is this, um, AP and Vacheron. But really at the top is Patek Felipe. So finally, the lady says, let me tell you why people buy Patek Felipe watches. Why? She said, it takes a thousand people to make one watch. So what do you mean? A thousand employees built one watch. Every watch has been touched by a thousand of us before you buy one. Get out of here. Yes. Wow. Do you know if you buy six watches from Patek Felipe, Patek Felipe will make the seventh one handmade, one of a kind, just for you and your family. So it stays within the family. I'm a legacy guy. To me, it's all about generational. It's all about legacy to me, right? So I sat there and said, oh my gosh, like, uh, this is great. This could be one of my sons. This could be one of my kids. I could pass this on to somebody else. And then I go to the 75, 80 year old guy that uh, these kids are looking at PBD and saying, Oh my gosh, that's my dad. And one day dad's not there. It's your own funeral and you're gone. What are your kids going to be thinking about you? And then what is that person going to be counting on you? But at the same time, I bring it back and I say, and there's a lot of people nowadays that are 70 years old that are relying on their social security check. There are a lot of people nowadays that are seven years old that are working at Walmart checking receipts because that $1,200 a month is a lot of money for them. There's a lot of people today that are doing that. They need to supplement their $1,200 a month social security check and their section eight that's paying their rent partially and they're paying 500 bucks a month for rent because of section eight. Why is that? Probably because that 70 year old man, when he was in his 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they don't realize he's going to be 70 that quickly. And the 20, 30, 40 year old version of that man, they didn't take care of the 70 year old version of him. And that message for me created a level of urgency, Mike, I can't explain to you. That level of urgency that was created in my life, I said, this is it. We're going to go get this thing done. I don't have as much time as I think I have. And uh, that changed the game for me. Yeah, that, that's probably one of the most uh, 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 powerful quotes I've ever heard in my life from a Persian singer, which is pretty wild. 
Yeah. So, so I lied to you. One more question. The, <laughs> that was, that was awesome. And I want to end with this one. Uh, and this is for all of our brothers and sisters out there in the financial services industry, which has been primarily designed to make money either for yourself or for your clients. Man, I don't know if you said it, but I'm definitely going to give you the credit for it. You said, if your goal is to make millions, you will slow down. But if your goal is to master your craft, you will not. There is no slowing down. Can you give us your takeaway on that? And then we'll wrap. Yeah, because money's boring. I mean, money has a lifespan. Think about it. Money has a lifespan. Just think about that. Money has a lifespan. Let me explain. I have in my pocket right now, I pulled out some money the other day. I have $300 in my pocket. I rarely have cash. I'm the worst guy with cash. And I feel bad because sometimes I have to tip and I don't have cash. So I carry money just for one reason, for tips. It's the only reason why I carry, carry cash, okay? So here's the question. Ready? How long is this $300 going to last in my hands? That's lifespan. Money has a lifespan. Okay. This thing's got a lifespan. This is going to go. It's going to go in someone else's hands. How many hands are going to touch this? What, what part of the world is it going to end up in China? Maybe Japan, maybe someone has this and it's their money and it goes to Chase Bank, then B of A, then a credit union, then a military, but it's going to go all over the world. This is going to travel. It's got a lifespan. Listen, legacy and expertise and mastery doesn't have a lifespan. That's forever. Let me explain what I mean by that. Shakespeare is dead. He's not dead. He's still alive. Einstein's not dead. He's still alive. Churchill is still alive. George Washington, still alive. Lincoln, he's still alive. Benjamin Franklin, he ain't dead. He's alive. I'm not talking alive like they're living on an island with Elvis and freaking Prince and Tupac and all. I'm not talking that kind of alive, like conspiracy theory alive. You know what I'm talking about? Like Pat just said, these guys are out and they're going to quote me on this. But I'm talking about they're not dead. They are around. Everybody talks about them. But the people that chase money, they are really dead because no one's talking about them. Their legacy is over with because they chase money. Money has a lifespan. I'm so surprised when so many people uh, commit to just going after money only. And by the way, let me say the other part. So this may be a little bit contradictory. Money is, I, I, listen, <laughs> if we can finish on this, I'll say this. There's a weird thing going on in America today. Very weird thing going on in America today. I did a video uh, two weeks ago about Venezuela and what's going on with Venezuela. And it's got a lot of controversy. I get comments about it all the time. I get stopped in the streets because of the Venezuela video in Dallas because they recognize the car. But I tell you where America is going today. Okay. When Obama was first running, Republicans thought he would never win. Never. No one's going to become a president and Think about the uh, Obamacare and affordable health care. We are never going to have nationalized health insurance. Who got elected? Obama. How many times? Twice. Who did he beat? He beat McCain, who had a resume and a half. And then he beat Romney. How did that happen? Sandy Hook, boom, done. Romney's toast. He almost beat him. Romney didn't debate the last debate properly. He said, well, you don't say anything because single women don't vote for you. So you didn't bring up Benghazi. Obama got reelected. Okay, how many people create a video saying Trump will never be president? Who, who became president? Trump became president. So the same Republicans that thought Obama was never going to be president uh, are the same. Then Democrats said Trump's never going to be president. For 12 years, both Rep Republicans and Democrats have been spooked. It's very simple. Everyone's been spooked. Okay, where am I going with this? Let me explain to where I'm going with this. We have a girl out of uh, New York who has become a famous congresswoman in her late 20s, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And she is spreading the message of socialism and it's blowing up. And people are listening to it. She made Amazon not move to New York. A freaking Amazon empire is moving to New York, bringing 25,000 jobs at an average salary of 150 thousand dollars the city of new york was going to make 10 to 20 billion dollars just because of amazon over the next 10 to 20 years and new york had to pay them 3.2 billion dollars it's very normal when a business moves to another city they pay money for you to move that's just what you do you're helping them out to move to your place and she was celebrating and governor kumo who's a, uh, a governor of new york who is a democrat is like what the hell are you talking about we need amazon here moral of the story a bernie and aoc those are becoming cool today because baby boomers, 76 million of them, the same boomers that voted for Reagan are the same boomers that voted for Jimmy Carter back in 77. 
we, we have to understand this part. Like this isn't like boomers age 20 years, but boomers had 76 million. Millennials have 80 million. 80 million who relate more to Bernie and relate more to AOC than anybody else. What is the moral of the story, Pat? Taxes are about to go to 70% in the next four to 10 years. Say Trump gets reelected because the left doesn't really have a real candidate. Biden, uh, Booker, Kamala, you know, they don't, uh, Bloomberg said he's now running, Hillary's now running. There's not really a solid candidate. Be, you know, O'Rourke, or, or uh, the Beto guy is saying he's not going to run. He could be an Obama S type of a guy. So there's not really anybody that the left can really get excited about. But you know what is going to happen with this next campaign? A lot of people are going to hear about a lot of socials and philosophies. It's very convincing. And you're going to see America go to a 70% tax bracket in the next four, six, 10 years. And what does that mean to you? If you don't make millions in the next few years and protect yourself, you're going to be in a bad situation in the next six, 10 years because taxes are going to go to 70%. And remember when I said this, some people say, Pat, you're out of your mind. Watch a state like California hit 70% top line. So on one end, it's important to realize mastery is the key. Uh, it, doing it for a bigger cause than yourself is what makes you keep going. But if it's money, you'll slow down. At the same time, just make sure the next two to four years, you go make millions and you set aside millions because you're going to need it six years from now. Wholesalers, financial advisors, you're welcome. That was a absolute pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> hey, Pat, Pat, David, thanks so much for being on the show today. And uh, personally, thank you for being inspiring, for being a man's man for saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Appreciate you as a, as a man of, of, uh, of America, frankly. And I'm sure that I can uh, speak on behalf of all the people that you've touched in, in, in your life and in, throughout your work and, and appreciate you for that as well and say thank you on, on their behalf. Um, you know, I'm sure that we all wish you much fortune and success both now and in the future. And as we say on the awesome Wholesaler Experience Podcast, it is about the journey. And we wish you well on yours, sir. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the show. And most of all, thanks for being awesome. Good night, everybody.